The Condit Dam held back the water of Washington's White Salmon River for a century. Until one crisp October day in 2011, when engineers pushed a detonation button. We had no idea what was going to happen. And so we were just sort of watching history unfold before our eyes. This was the largest dam removal that had ever been attempted, an incredible engineering feat. Perhaps more importantly, it symbolized hopes for the white salmon's future. When the dam was breached successfully and things started moving out, it was uh, kind of the, the dawn of a new era for the White Salmon River. The hopes of river runners, biologists, and local tribes were all staked on one unknown premise. If the dam were gone, the white salmon would return to its natural state. But no one could say for sure how long this would take, or what it might even look like. Now, a decade has passed, and some of those answers are starting to be seen. The white salmon is one of the most unique rivers in the Pacific Northwest. It flows year-round from the glaciers of Mount Adams. The water rushes cold and fast through forests and farmlands. For some 45 miles, it ends when it meets the Columbia River. Ecologically, it sits almost exactly on the dividing line between the wetter west and the drier east. And since time immemorial, it has been the traditional fishing and gathering grounds of tribes such as Wishram, Klickitat, and Yakima. More recently, it has gained a reputation as one of the best whitewater rivers in the Northwest. Nice. Yup! You guys only really need to paddle when I'm telling you to. Stay together. I've kind of grown up around this river, whether it be through just kayaking or even just playing in it when I was younger. Don't need to jump that far. Well, it's funny but I'm only a river runner to keep up with my kids. Okay. Even when the dam stood, the upstream section was a river runner's delight, with playful, splashy rapids, sudden small drops, and rock gardens to deftly weave through. The white salmon cuts a narrow channel through solid basalt cliffs, and in some spots, the river is so pinched, the boaters get out and walk and send their rafts on their own. Even experienced kayakers sometimes skip the falls to do a seal launch off the cliffs below. This section of the white salmon is officially designated as wild and scenic. It's the special quality of the river's natural wildness that had river runners intrigued. If the river looked like this above the dam, what would the rest of the river look like if the dam were gone? Would there be new rapids to run, waterfalls revealed? And could they travel with the river all the way to the Columbia? Right up in here, we're starting to see um, some of the first spaces where you actually start to see the river has changed and eroded some. Prior to the dam removal, when this bridge came into view, paddlers knew that their time on the river was over and they would soon take out. But from this point forward, the river ahead is one they had only been able to imagine, especially since this part of the river was deep underwater. This section used to be the reservoir of Condit Dam, once known as Northwestern Lake. You can still see the line of cabins perched above the river, which were once lakefront. Yeah, it's a river again, and as opposed to a lake. Like, we would be paddling against the wind here. Breaching the dam was the equivalent of pulling the plug on an enormous bathtub. But it wasn't the water the engineers were worried about. The big unknown was what would happen to the estimated 2.4 million cubic yards of sediment that had been building up for nearly a century. Watching the lake drain, it was phenomenal. It was like watching a million years of geology happening in the space of minutes. 
football field sizes of land and dirt that would just kind of like start to liquefy and then spin and swirl and turn into mud and just go downstream. One of the biggest hopes of removing the Condit Dam and draining the reservoir was that the white salmon would return to its original river channel and that the plants and trees along its banks would regrow. But no one knew how long this would take to recover or if it even would. Jeanette Burkhart has been at the forefront of the revegetation efforts. We have to not expect this to behave the same way as a site that has soil, like across the river. We have to treat this more like something like a Mount St. Helens, where you're starting at ground zero. With the help of more than 500 volunteers, some 7,000 plants, shrubs, and trees have been planted. But it hasn't been without setbacks. Both flood and drought have taken a toll. But some of the hardier species planted here have managed to hang on. This one here is Oregon white oak. It has sort of leathery leaves that help it to be very drought tolerant in dry conditions. And it has a deep tap root, so it can get water from a long ways down even when the surface has dried out. Some of the tallest trees that you'll see out here right now are ponderosa pines. And just remember, if you look at the site, there would have been nothing here. So these are becoming established and the worst is hopefully behind them now and it will be just gangbusters from here on out. <laughs> We are coming up to where uh, Condit Dam used to be. This is the, the old dam site right here. If you didn't know the dam had been here, the former site looks simply like a narrow spot where two cliffs squeeze the river. This natural narrow is the reason that the original builders picked the spot to build the dam in the first place. Work started in 1912. Using the canyon's own basalt to make concrete, the Condit Dam rose 125 feet tall about the height of a 12-story building. It took the original workers a year to build. And even with heavy equipment, it took modern workers a year to dismantle. When the last of it had been removed, exactly a century had passed. For some, their history of the river goes much further back. Yellow Wash Washeen's grandparents and generations before them saw the river prior to the dam. He witnessed it the day the dam was breached. This is the first time he's been back. This river was a big part of our homeland to what is known as the Klickitat people. We always have this belief since the beginning of our time here, our people, that this water is uh, the life uh, of our mother here, this ground, this earth. When you hear the sound, it's alive. And uh, it has a big meaning. And our language is trush, and it's life, water is life. So when they took the dam out, that was like a renewal to the way that the uh, crater had intended for this water to flow. I'm just glad to be back down here. You know, I, I could just put a camp right here and just listen to this, the sound of this river, you know, that makes the soothing, it soothes you. Renews your spirit, that's what it does, you know. The company that ran the dam, Pacificor, still owns land below the former dam site. Now, the Confederated Tribes and Bands of Yakima Nation have the first right to buy it. One more step toward the cultural restoration and stewardship of the white salmon. Below the former dam site is one of the most beautiful secrets of the white salmon, a gorge so deep and narrow that it is accessible only to those who come by the path of the water. But when the dam was in place, this canyon often had too little water to boat and too little water for salmon to swim upstream. When Condit Dam was due for recommissioning in the 1990s, environmental regulations required building new fish passage facilities 
the cost of updating the dam to modern standards exceeded the value of the electricity it supplied. In the end, it was an economic decision to remove the dam. But the hope for the future was an ecological one. With the river unblocked and allowed to flow free again, would it bring back the endangered salmon? It's fall, and the Chinook have returned. These are bright fall Chinook, swimming up the lower white salmon. They have come all the way from the Pacific, back to the place of their birth. This is the very last moment of their life cycle, where they will spawn and die. A female will lay some 8,000 eggs, but only about 1% of her offspring will make it back here as adults. Seeing the carcasses of the Chinook, you understand why this river is called White Salmon. Once they come into fresh water, they're quickly deteriorating, and their meat is almost always like white. As soon as they don't have the color that you think of as a salmon color. Well, I'll just pull the carcasses to record important data. Got a fresh one. Yeah. Scale card number? 16107. We're going to get a sex on the fish and a fork length as well as some scales, and we get age data from the scales. Elise and her team have been tracking the fall and spring Chinook runs since the removal of Condit Dam. I'll count from the bank to you, if you want to count from you to the other bank. Perfect, yeah. So definitely some reds in between us. Yeah, there's definitely been some pretty drastic changes. When the dam was removed, the first couple of years after, there wasn't a ton of spawnable habitat down here, not a lot of really good gravel for them to, to create their nests and, and their reds. We have since seen a lot more gravel down the river, here lower, and a lot more fish activity and spawning just down in the river in general. It's had 16? 16, 16 I 17. 17? 17, yep. Sweet. The overall counts of returning salmon have fluctuated over the past several years. Most of the lows and highs seem to correspond with the annual counts in the Columbia River. Perfect. And larger scale factors, like ocean conditions and climate, complicate the effort to understand how much of a role dam removal has in salmon recovery. Chinook returned between the ages of three and six, so in the 10 years without the dam, there hasn't been enough cycles for biologists to see a trend. And it will take a few more generations. What is clear is that the river conditions have improved for the salmon to come home. Might be a little bit of a splash here. The white salmon now can move at its own pace. And river runners can move with it all the way to the Columbia. For us to be able to paddle all the way to the Columbia is pretty special. You feel like you've like made the river's natural journey. It's a pretty rare experience for a river runner to actually like run all the way out to the mouth of the river, and here we do. 